Hi, in this tutorial we're going to look at a method for making something like beads on a string, like a necklace, but of course it could be applied to any sort of scenario where you need an object to stick to a curve that, um, whether the curve is moving or not, whether it's a static curve or a dynamic curve, uh, this method will work and it's using MASH. Um, there are other ways to do this, but I won't record these here. Using motion paths or even a little bit of scripting uh, with a point on curve node, you can get a somewhat similar effect uh, without using MASH. But let's look at MASH here. So just to give you a quick demo of what's happening here. So you can see in this case, I'm using a dynamic curve. So it's being pulled down by gravity. And these spheres are sticking on the curve. And they are actually dynamic. So when they strike the ground, they kind of pile up like this. Now this method, I'm just realizing <laughs> now, the curve itself is not colliding with the floor, only the balls. Um, so there might be something that would have to be done to uh, make them stick to the dynamic curve that hits the floor, uh, but that shouldn't be too difficult. You just use dynamics in a different way here. Okay, so I'm going to start with a new scene and we will get going to build this. Okay, so we're back. Uh, the reason I'm starting from a fresh file rather than just deleting things um, in the original file is because we have MASH that, use, uh, that uses a dynamic bullet solver. And deleting uh, the, the MASH network when it's got a bullet solver attached to it can sometimes uh, lead to problems crashing and so on, which actually is what happened. So uh, I'm just starting from scratch here. So just keep that in mind. So I've got a curve and a sphere. These have their history deleted and their transformations frozen. So what we're going to do is just take the sphere and go to MASH. And I'll just, I'm not using any shortcuts here, so you can just see what I'm doing. Uh, go to MASH, create MASH network. And for this, we're just going to create instances and we'll use a, a linear distribution type. This doesn't really matter because we're essentially going to turn it off uh, in a moment anyway. So applying close, so a MASH network is created and a MASH instancer. Now if we go into MASH and open up the attribute editor, you can see the only node is the MASH distribute node and it's linear and here's where we can change the number of spheres. But going back to the MASH waiter, we can add a curve node here. So if we wanted to, we could just use our necklace curve, drag it in here, and you can see that something weird is happening. If we go into the distribute node, we can just turn off the distance in X. And now you can see they're distributed along the curve. Now, if we go back to the curve node, you can see the step is set to 0.1. That's why they're only getting 10% of the way along here. So if you go all the way to the end, it will fill in the rest of the curve. You can see it doesn't quite to the end. And if you wanted to change this, you can just do the offset along curve here to even it out. Now if I play my animation though, you can see that these are animated, which is useful in some scenarios, but not in this one. So we can turn the animation speed to zero. Okay, so this is good. And if we wanted to animate this curve, then these spheres will follow. Okay, so really that's all there is to um, attaching an object to a curve using MASH. Now there are other settings in here that you can turn to. So if you wanted to vary the time steps so they're not exactly so evenly spaced, um, you can adjust these things. There are lots of different things you can do here. Um, you don't have exact precision where each one goes. If you want to do that, there might be other solutions that I'll talk about in a different video. Uh, but you get a lot of control here in the MASH curve node. But this is not exactly what we were trying to do. What we were trying to do is attach this to a dynamic curve. So let's go back and do that. I'm just going to undo my way out of this. Okay, so now we're back and we have no MASH node. So before we make the MASH network, this time we're going to make this curve dynamic. And this will involve a little bit of discussion because there are a number of things we might want to change here. 
So we'll select the curve and under the FX menu, go to N hair, make selected curves dynamic. And we'll open up the options because if we just reset, the only thing we have to change, and if, if you don't change this, it's not going to actually make a difference, but there are no curves to attach this to, or sorry, no surfaces to attach this curve to. And the output we want is the default, just a NURBS curve. We don't want this other stuff. So make curve dynamic, and nothing seems to have happened, but when we play the animation, you can see there is a second curve here now that is moving, and it's being pulled down by gravity. One thing to note is if you look at my time line here, then my time range, I've got 2,000 frames. So you, I just added some extra frames to uh, give some more time for this to play out. So if you just click in this one here and type in a value like 5,000, it will extend the entire frame range. This is the the last visible frame. This is the last frame in the entire timeline. So by typing 5,000 in here, it forces this one to go to 5,000. The other thing to change in the timeline, right click in the timeline itself. Okay, you're not going to be able to see this. Let me just shrink my window for a second. Right click in the timeline, playback speed. I want to make sure it's set to one of these two play play every frame options and I'm just going to leave it on play every frame maximum real time. Okay. So now if I play my animation again, you'll see that it's being pulled down by gravity, uh, but not totally straight down. It's kind of offset to one side. Now this is a bit of a peculiarity with the N hair system. It has it is N hair, so it's a nucleus system, but it actually has some of the old pre nucleus um, hair settings in there. So because of this, it's worth spending a little time poking around the hair system. So when you create um, a dynamic curve, you get a few nodes here. You get a nucleus node, so the nucleus node sets the environmental conditions, so gravity gravity direction, um, air density, wind speed, and so on, and how it solves collisions, what scale your scene is at, and all this sort of stuff. And the benefit of using nucleus is that any other nucleus objects, particles, cloth, if they are ruled by the same nucleus node, they'll interact with each other. So we can just leave this alone. Uh, we also get the hair system one follicles. And we don't see a follicle here, but there is a, a follicle node. And so normally a follicle is stuck onto a surface that you attach a hair to, keeping the hair analogy going. Um, but what's important here is that the follicle has the original curve attached to it, so the non-dynamic curve. And down here we have the hair system output curves. And this one, curve one in this case, this is the dynamic curve. So if we play the animation, you can see that this is the one that's reacting to forces in the world, in this case to the gravity set here in the nucleus node. So ultimately when we attach our pearls to our necklace, it's this dynamic curve that we want to choose in MASH. However, the main settings for the hair system are found here in the hair system one node. And if we go to the hair system shape, we'll see a whole bunch of stuff here. And I don't really want to go through all of this, and most of it is not relevant. But I want to try and explain why this is um, acting the way it is and how we can change that. So actually, before we go in there, we have to figure out why the dynamic curve is still attached at both ends of the original curve. And the answer for that is in the follicle shape. And if we just look here, we have point lock both ends. If I turn this just to base, and you'll see a different sort of response here. And now you can see this point is not locked. So you can see it's keeping some of its original shape. And that's what's making it sort of deform off to the side here a little bit too. I'm going to turn this back on to both ends. That's really all we need in the um, 
in the follicle. Okay, so if we head back to the hair system, so we've got clump and hair shape, doesn't matter because we're not actually rendering this. Well, I mean, we could render it as a string, but we would just use Arnold's curve rendering tools for that. So we don't care about the thickness exactly, the width scale. So we're just going to close that. Collision. So this is part of the nucleus node. So this hair, this uh, dynamic curve, will collide with other dynamic things um, if they're in the nucleus node. Okay, and so this is how its collisions are handled. Then we've got dynamic properties, so stretch resistance, compression resistance, and so on. And you'll notice this stiffness scale here. And we can change it, but it's not going to make a difference because this is a multiplier of a stiffness setting that we actually can't see. There are some other things here like start curve attract that might be useful if we turn this all the way up and play the animation. You can see it tries to stay stuck to the original curve. We're not going to use that here. And then we can change the mass of the hair, the drag, and so on. There's also a built-in turbulence, and so this is sort of a holdover from uh, old versions of hair. Um, now, most most of the time when you're using a nucleus dynamic object, you have an external turbulence that will control it. But this is actually kind of handy, so if we want to turn this up and play the animation, you can see there is some turbulence that is affecting the animation of the curve here. But I don't want any turbulence here. Things like shading, this is part of the old system, um, hair color and so on, but we're not going to use any of that. So then the question is, if I play the animation, why is it sort of biasing over here to the left? That's because um, the way that the stiffness works in a hair is that it should be stiffer at the base and get less stiff towards the tip um, so it can move more naturally. But we can't change that as it is right now. If we go into things like stretch resistance and reduce this to a very low but non-zero number, we can play the animation and you can see it's acting differently, but it's still biasing over to this area here. Now, I don't know 100% how to solve this, uh, but I think I have a, an idea. So if you go back to the top of the hair system shape, you can turn off use nucleus solver. And essentially this turns us into an old fashioned hair uh, in the olden days of Maya before nucleus. And then if we just scroll down here, now you can see instead of those dynamic properties associated with the nucleus node or the nucleus system, we have the old version. And so we have stiffness here. And now the stiffness scale is set like this. And now you can see it's equally stiff at the tip and at the base. If I change this graph here, so this is the base, this is the tip. Now you can see it's less stiff here. Then if I reduce both of them, now we're kind of getting more what we want. Actually, this kind of animation works a little better for, for what we want. Um, so we can leave it on the non-nucleus version. It really depends on what you want to do. But with that turned off, and maybe I turn stiffness down, it's another way of getting the same sort of thing. Now it's not biasing in one direction. So if I go back to use the nucleus solver, I'm just going to save my scene. go back to use the nucleus solver and play the animation, you kind of get this weird combination of the two. So there might be a way to solve this uh, entirely. I don't know. It kind of depends on what you want to do. So for now, if I just turn off the nucleus solver, then we just get kind of more straightforward animation. There's probably an easy way to solve this. I just don't know what it is, if anybody knows be happy to hear it. Okay, anyway, all that to say 
now we have a new curve that we want to use and we're going to use this for our mash node instead so if we take our sphere and we go to mash create mash network just like before and we had a curve node and now the input curve that we want to put in here is the dynamic one, and that's this curve under the output curves group, or translate, uh, transform node. So now that's connected. Go back to mash distribute, reduce the distance in distribute, and here we can change the number of points. If we go back to the curve, now again, can turn up the step amount to one, turn off animation. Maybe we want to offset it, offset along curve just so they're evenly spaced and we can go back into the distribute node and add more let's not add too many so I'm trying to avoid having them overlapping from the beginning and maybe I can't avoid that so I'll just leave it like this. The only reason I'm starting with the curve in this position is that it's just a little easier to select. It's probably smarter to start with it in the other position. So if I go back like this, now you can see they're not colliding with each other from the beginning anyway. Um, offset curve. There it is. Just trying to get it kind of even. All these things with noise and velocity, since we have no animation, it doesn't really matter. If we want to make them less than perfectly um, spaced, we can adjust the time step variation. But of course, we'll run into overlapping problems if we do too much of that. So I'm just going to leave it at zero. Save my scene. Now if I play the animation, we get something like this. So that's pretty good. Now, of course, this doesn't have to be dynamic, or the curve doesn't have to be dynamic if you just want this thing to be able to move around. It could be on a static curve. So I am going to now, if I play the animation, you'll see that these balls, when they hit each other, they go through each other. And that might be fine for what you want. So this next step is, again, optional depending on what you're trying to do. But I want these to be able to bump into each other. So I'm going to go to Mash for this Mash node and add a Dynamics node. So this is where things get a little bit confusing because now we're dealing with three different dynamic systems. So one is the Nucleus node, which we told the hair not to use right now. And so then there's the Hair System uh, Dynamics node, which is using the kind of old-fashioned Maya dynamics just for simplicity and now this mash network has its own dynamics node and this is something called the bullet solver so that's a hard surface or a rigid body uh, collision solver and that will not interact with the nucleus node in any way or any of the other dynamic systems so in this case they're all completely um, separate from each other in terms of having uh, interacting simulations so if I play my animation, let me just hide this. If I play my animation, I know all the spheres are going to fall off now. Right? And they land on the floor. So in the bullet solver, it creates this invisible floor here. So let's just, before we go on, look at the new things that have been created. So in the mash node, we now have a dynamics uh, node where we can set things like the friction on the balls, the rolling friction. Uh, their velocity when they start, and, and so on. So there's a lot of things to set here, but you also have this thing called the bullet solver. And this is sort of like the nucleus node. It sets all the conditions. So the position of a ground, the gravity, the collision margin around things, um, things that the spheres might collide with. They collide with the ground, but that's a built-in collision. So if you want them to collide with other objects, you drag those objects in here. But none of these will interact with between each other, the nucleus, the bullet, and the old-fashioned hair. They're all independent of each other. 
Okay, so how do we prevent the balls from falling off the curve? That happens in the MASH Dynamics node. So a couple of things to look at here. Um, collision shape. So the collision shape is automatic. So it, it creates a, essentially what it's doing is looking at the shape of your object and creating a lower res version of it to calculate the collisions. This probably will work better, or it might work better if we just use sphere. So it will size a small sphere around this. So if you're using a cube, don't use the collision shape sphere, use box. Um, if you're using a more complex shape, use automatic. Um, you can also use mesh, which will actually convert the original mesh um, into a collision object, an invisible one. Uh, but that can take a lot longer to calculate. But it will give you more accurate results and potentially more crashing. Who knows? So um, all these settings, but the one that's important here is the mesh bias. And I've talked about this in other tutorials. Um, so the position strength, if we set this to one, you would think that would give you 100% of position strength. So this means listen to um, mash to get the position information for these. And it kind of works. It's hard to tell, but those spheres are actually moving. They're trying to follow. If you look, you can see they're moving very slowly. So maybe this is in a percentage. Instead of 1, we should use 100. Yep, that works better, but they're not following exactly. And so I'm not sure why this is, but you have to just give it a kind of a ludicrous amount. So we can put in 1,000, let's say, and force it to follow. And even there, it comes off the curve a little bit, but it's pretty good. Now you can see something that's happening here. These ones are rotating about because they're spinning due to gravity and their their motion. So here you can control rotational strength based on mesh too. So if I put in 100 here, let's see if that's enough to solve. So that's pretty good. That looks like it's solving it mostly. Maybe we want to go up to the same uh, high value. Yeah. But you can even see there that the collisions are overriding their attachment to the curve. But that's what we want. We do want them to, um, to collide with each other. I can even try a larger value. And so I'm looking down here to see how closely they stick to the string when they collide. So you can see how they're being pushed offset there. So, so this is not a perfect solution for simulating a necklace, for example, because if you need to see the strings as well, they may become detached or seem to become loose from the pearls. Now, if this was, you know, if we go back to the distribute node and really fill this up just before they're already overlapping each other, I'm going to save, then seeing the, the string doesn't really matter. Now you can see we run into some other problems here, and I'm just going to address this now um, because this comes up all the time when you use these mesh dynamics. So first of all, one way to solve that is just to loosen things up a bit. So let's say I go back to 28 in terms of the number. That's pretty good. There's still a little bit of uh, weird interaction between these two, or between these ones down here. See how they're bouncing around a little bit? So again, you can look at this and think, well, do I need just, can I get away with fewer of these? And does that help? Still a little bouncing around there. Okay, so now different things we can do to try and solve this. Now I don't have an absolute solution, but I can make some suggestions here. So in MASH Dynamics node, this is the one thing that often will help, switching to one of these simplified shapes. But let me go back to automatic and see if... Still a little bit of wiggling around there. Look at the bottom three. 
but that's actually a little bit better setting to automatic. You can change the collision shape scale to be a little bit smaller to allow them some overlap. There's still a little bit of jitter down there. I'm going to put this down to not as such a high number. Let's see. That's actually quite a bit better. So maybe having the position strength at too high a number um, causes some strange interactions. But the other place that you might want to make a change is actually, I'm going to turn this. Actually, no, I won't do that. If I go into the bullet solver itself, there are a few things to look at here. So you've got the star frame, you've got collision iteration. So you can always try to turn this up. And so this is just the number of times it checks for a collision. Uh, per frame, or at least that's my understanding. Um, and it can sometimes solve problems that way. But another thing you can do, let me just turn this back to eight, is to turn up the internal frame rate. So this is, um, I think, in megahertz, like in your screen, uh, your computer monitor. And so this is just a sort of frequency per, um, like waves per second, checks the, the number of times it's going to check per second. So if we turn this up, you might get a slightly different animation, but it's usually less uh, noisy. So you can turn it up to a very high value. I'm not sure we'll notice any difference here. Ah, yes, we are noticing. So it's checking so many times, I think it's falling behind. So you just use this carefully and see if turning it up a little bit helps solve the problem. Now I can see they are a little more offset from the curve when we do this. Anyway, all those things can help. So now what if we want to move this thing around? Well, we can take the original curve, this necklace curve one here, and we can actually animate this or we could you know, if it had clusters on it, we could animate those clusters and so on. But if I just set some keys on the translate Y and maybe rotate around X a bit, then we can kind of see how this can be moved around the scene. So let me just play this out a bit. And then I'll set a key on rotation and then just move it down in Y. So it's forcing those spheres to hit the floor. Now, when you animate something that has dynamics on it, um, you're setting keyframes, you won't see an immediate uh, response to your changes because that has to be calculated frame by frame. So, but once we start playing the animation, we should see its effects. I'm just gonna save my scene. So you can see that the balls are um, hitting this floor and reacting to it. And that's because this floor is part of the bullet solver system. And it's the bullet solver that is controlling the dynamics on the spheres because they're part of the mash network. The curve, the dynamic curve is not part of the mash network. Uh, so it's listening to its own dynamics. I'm going to save my scene. I'm going to go back into that hair system and experiment a little bit. If I go back into the hair system shape, I can turn on Use Nucleus Solver and let's see how different it is. So just the swinging of the thing is a little bit different because um, we're not using the old uh, dynamics and so we still have that kind of weird biasing when we play the animation up here but you can see that everything else is still working so what if we put a collision object in the same location as that floor and make it a collider for the oops For the nucleus curve. I know this is getting a little complicated, but anyway, let's 
just see how this works. So to make a collision object for that curve, we just select it. I'm going to delete its history and modify freeze its transformation. So it's just nice and clean. Call this floor. Let's call it nucleus end floor. Just so it's clear. Um, and we go to end cloth and create a passive collider. So that will collide with anything inside the same nucleus node uh, as it. So that does not include the bullet solver. In this case, it only includes that curve. I'm going to save because I have a feeling this could crash. All right, so now we're getting the curve hitting the floor, and it is responding to that. It's interesting, though, the... Uh, like the balls are preventing it from happening. Oh no, there it goes. So what would be interesting to see is if we turn off the bullet solver floor, the one that is causing the spheres to pile up right now. Just turn off the ground for the bullet solver. And now let's see what happens. Hitting six on my keyboard just to see textured mode. Right, so we're getting kind of a similar effect, but now everything is just being driven by the curve colliding with the ground here. Although I have to admit, it's not behaving exactly as I would have predicted because it's not colliding exactly on the floor. It's almost like the balls are getting in the way. So you can see they're sliding around a lot. You can go into the floor and turn up the friction if you want to. You can also go into the, um, so that would be friction with the curve. So, I, well, maybe they're just sliding around just as much. It's kind of hard to know here. But that's how you can use MASH, dynamic curve, bullet solver, nucleus, not nucleus, all these things together to attach objects to a curve and animate them in kind of an interesting and natural way. I hope you find this useful. I know it's a little bit confusing, but uh, there's a, a lot of promise and potential in a technique like this. Thanks.